This is the War Memorial in Stratford, Ontario, and it's typical of all the war memorials across Canada, in every village, in every town, and in every city. And these memorials are gateways to the First World War. Unfortunately, most Canadians have forgotten the First World War, and they don't realize that it was the greatest and most traumatic episode in our history. 400,000 Canadians went overseas between 1914 and 18, and 60,000 died for King and Empire. Canadian National Memorial Park on Vimy Ridge in the heart of France. People say there are 60,000 trees in this park, one for every Canadian killed in the Great War. The park is a gift of the people of France to the people of Canada. In its center stands Canada's National Memorial dedicated to those Canadians who died in the Great War. Of those men, much has now been forgotten. But even as the grass grows over shell holes, mine craters and trenches, the land remembers. Land given in gratitude for a victory no one thought possible, the capture of Vimy Ridge. In 1917, there are no trees. Vimy Ridge is bare, a muddy, forbidding fortress, a six-mile-long bastion of the German army that has conquered northern France. Since German armies invaded Belgium and France, the war has been fought along a line stretching from the North Sea to the Alps, what is called the Western Front. Some of the most ferocious battles have taken place in the Vimy sector, just north of the ancient French city of Arras. Having captured the coal fields of northern France, the Germans are determined to keep them and turn two ridges, Notre Dame de Lorette and Vimy, into impregnable fortresses to protect their plunder. And in late 1916, it is to the Vimy front that the four Canadian divisions come marching from the nearby battlefield of the Somme, where they had suffered 25,000 casualties. A bloodbath such as Canada had never known. Now mistrustful of the British High Command and its officers, the Canadians are ordered to Vimy. Among the survivors of the Somme is Donald Fraser, a cool, tough Scot from Alberta. We are treading the road again on the way to a new front. Slag heaps become a prominent feature of the landscape. Countryside embracing Notre Dame de Lorette and Vimy Ridge is somewhat pretty. Round here are scattered the ruins of quite a number of houses. On the other side of the valley, opposite us, is the northern end of Vimy Ridge, occupied by the enemy. Next to Vimy de Lorette Promontory has been the scene of such frequent and bloody combats that the French call it the Butte de la Mort, the Ridge of Death. In 1915, the French had driven the Germans from Notre Dame de Lorette, but they failed to capture Vimy Ridge. After months of savage fighting, French missing, wounded, and dead, numbered 150,000.
We're at the Latargette French Military Cemetery near Vimy Ridge. And it's one of the many French cemeteries in the area that commemorate the fallen of 1915. The fighting around this particular area, Nouvelle saint va was ferocious. At the initial stages of the war, the French wanted to push the Germans out and felt that by continuously driving at the Germans, they would ultimately break through and force the Germans to retreat as they had done at the Marne in 1914. They just kept hammering at them and hammering at them. The problem was here, the Germans didn't break. They just kept hammering back. The French built very big cemeteries, massive cemeteries, and you, you do feel the, the massive loss, but at the same time, you don't sense the individual loss. The British Commonwealth cemeteries are smaller and more individual. So they, they both have a different effect, but both are very sad. In the winter of 1916, the dead from the year before are still unburied at Vimy Ridge. As Agar Adamson, the 53-year-old commander of the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, soon discovers when he enters the trenches. My dear Mabel, here below Vimy Ridge in Nouvelle saint va we are suffering a great deal of irritation from rats. In one cave leading into the trench, when the French were here, the Germans refused to come out and shot a French officer who went down. The French then put smoke bombs down the shaft and suffocated them all, 280 of them. They are still there, huddled together as they died. It is a dreadful and unsavory sight with thousands of rats. I'm having the shaft closed and sealed up with cement. Well, that's it for today, old girl. Ever thine, Agar. In the ferocious struggle, to drive the French back from Vimy, the Germans had suffered 140,000 casualties. We're in Nouvelle saint va German military cemetery near Vimy Ridge. It's the largest German cemetery in the area and contains about 45,000 burials. German cemeteries of this nature put four men to a cross. The ones that are headstones and not crosses are Jewish. Jewish German soldiers. This is, uh, I don't know if I can pronounce his name, Isidore Matkol. He was killed November 1916. German cemeteries have a different atmosphere, one of foreboding and one of uh, sadness and pain. It's a, different, it's a different atmosphere than a British cemetery, which is like an Edwardian garden. I think when you, you lose a war, such as the First World War, where you lose millions of men at, for nothing at the end, I think it's got to have a devastating effect on the national character. Rifling the dead used to be considered the ghoulish business in pre-war times. But over here, the dead are of no account. They are scattered all over the battle area. I observed the row of dugouts built along the side of the ridge. The first dugout had a corrugated iron roof pretty well smashed in by a shell. Peering in through the entrance, I was astonished to see, almost in skeletal stage, a man in underclothes reclining on a bed. On the floor lay the remains of two other Germans. They must have met death suddenly. I cut three buttons of the tunic of one of them. It was a peculiar experience, peeping into the dugouts in this quiet and dark ravine and witnessing the result of tragedies enacted over a year ago. By 1916, the British and French armies are exhausted, with casualties totaling more than a million. Undiscouraged by such enormous loss of life, the generals plan a vast new offensive for 1917. The British will attack from Arras, while the French attack 80 miles to the south at the Chemin des Dames. The Canadian objective will be the most formidable of all, the German fortress of Vimy Ridge. Among the first to arrive on the Vimy front is 54-year-old Canadian Army Chaplain, Canon Frederick Scott, whose son had been killed only weeks before at the Somme. It was certain now that all serious fighting was at an end till spring. 
So everyone settled down to his world with a sense of relief and tried to make the best of things. The men were in splendid spirits, and we were all buoyed up with the hope that we were going to end the war. I used to speak about the war outlook and tell them there are only two issues, victory or slavery. And which shall it be, boys? And a shout, victory, went up. As they crouch in their freezing winter trenches, Canadian troops know they face a fateful year, and they suspect that their next task will be to attack Vimy, the Ridge of Death. I had a service on New Year's Eve. The theater was filled with men. Rumors were abroad that with the opening of spring, we were to begin an offensive, and it was generally believed that towards the close of the next year, we might hope for the end of hostilities. The visions came before us of the terrible battlefields of the sun and of the faces who had gone. Then we all rose and there was a brief moment of silent prayer. At midnight the buglers sounded the last post and the band struck up the hymn, O oh God our help in ages past. A mighty chorus of voices joined in the well-known strains. It was an inspiring sight and we all felt we were beginning a year that was to decide the destinies of the Empire. When they arrive on the Vimy front, the Canadians have not yet recovered from the bloodbath of the Somme. Their British commander, Julian Bing knows he has only a few months to transform his exhausted Canadians into a single dynamic fighting force, the Canadian Corps. Under Bing, the four Canadian divisions spend their first winter together, sharpening their fighting skills against the Germans at the base of Vimy Ridge, on the Crater Line, an eight kilometer front of huge mine craters blown by the Germans and French in their struggle for Vimy Ridge. The crater line is a deadly place, with Canadians and Germans only meters apart, as Agar Adamson writes to his wife, Mabel. Dear Mabel, our front line is most curious, consisting of craters with the Bosch on the higher lip and we on the lower, less than 50 feet apart. The craters are about 20 feet deep, filled with barbed wire thrown in by both sides. We are very close, and both sides snipe continuously. We had one killed and four wounded last night. Our snipers claim to have shot six, including one staff officer, but this cannot be depended upon. Ever thine, Agar. We're in the Vimy Memorial Park, and these are the Canadian front lines of 1917. The crater line was one of the most dangerous positions on the front. Unfortunately, most of the front was crater line. Any man here could be killed in any way at any time. They were so close to the Germans. They were deathly afraid of, of mines going up. And they were deathly afraid of trench mortars. From their position inside the trench, they could actually see a trench mortar being launched up in the air like a football being punted. And of course, they would know where it's going to land and they'd have to run like hell to try to get away from it. It was a really terrifying experience. But perhaps what scared them the most and especially in the crater line were the enemy snipers because they're only 150 feet away. One newcomer on the crater line is a freshly arrived volunteer from Nova Scotia, 26-year-old Will Bird. Will is a crack shot, an ideal sniper. But inexperienced troops coming into the line, like when Will Bird first came into the line, they were the easy targets, and the Germans would pick them off on a regular basis, and because the only thing showing was their head, the only thing that would be hit was their head, and they could just pick them off, silent death, boom. The distance was not more than 100 yards, and I had crosshair sights. It was not a great shot, but I'd really killed a Hun, my first. A second German, wherein his full pack appeared in the same place. I shot him as soon as he appeared. Another man appeared. He had his hair close cropped and binoculars in his hand. I shot him, and as he went down, the binoculars were flung in a high loop over his head. 
With German guns and snipers looking down from the heights of Vimy Ridge, the fighting moves underground, with sappers digging tunnels right up to and under German lines. And as new arrivals, Will Bird and his pal Tommy are sent into the tunnels to dig in sweaty silence only meters away from the Germans. They lowered Tommy and me down by a ladder that was quite vertical to a chalk tunnel. When we got down there, all sound stilled and it was warm. We had to shed our great coats and equipment at once. We went crouching on all fours along a tunnel in solid chalk just four feet high and hardly three feet wide. The chalk face was sprayed with vinegar. Then one man cut it with a knife as it softened and passed back large chunks to his helper. At any moment, it was possible the removal of a new chunk might reveal a German dugout filled with men. For weeks afterwards, my whole body would tense as I thought of that night. We're in the grain subway that runs under the Canadian front lines at Vimy Ridge. Vimy was synonymous with the tunnels leading to and from the front lines. All the troops would come through here, going up to the front and returning to the depot. This is the CO's office, I believe, or this is the officer's quarters. And these are very nice. You can see they actually got beds. This is more than the other troops would get. My dear Mabel, it is very late at night, and even in the bowels of the earth with an oil stove smoking, it is very cold. A little after midnight, the mining detachment are going to blow up their mines with a view to destroying the German tunnels, which are above ours. Thank you for the bundle of socks. Ever thine, Agar. This is a hand bore, so they could dig into the chalk. One of the problems with mining around here, particularly in chalk, is that the poor, unfortunate infantry on the top could hear you mining because the chalk doesn't hold the sound. So you could actually hear them digging in. And of course, when they stopped digging, that's when they'd start to bring the bags of ammonia up. So they knew that sooner or later, there was going to be a blow. And that would probably be the most terrifying period uh, of all. The mining officer would come up, and he would listen to the ground. And he would find out when they're going to blow. But of course, the mining officer was instructed never to talk to the infantry. So whenever he was around, they had to get very uh, concerned. Dear Mabel, we can hear the Germans working a mine over one of our mines and under part of our line. We will have to let one off pretty soon or be too late. The miners are curious fellows and say there is no hurry as they are still working and have not commenced putting in the explosives. They have said this before and been out in their counting. Goodbye, my dear. Ever thine, Agar. You can actually see how far it goes down, and they go down to a certain depth, and then they decide to go under the German lines. And then they would have a gallery, they'd dig a little hole for all the ammonia, and there'd be bags and bags of it, and then they would fill it full of sandbags so that when the explosive charge went, it would go straight up in the air, and none of it would be diverted laterally. And that was the whole science of mining warfare. From the crater line, larger tunnels, nicknamed subways, lead back behind the lines towards the ruins of mont saint alloy at the heart of the Canadian sector. These are the ruins of mont saint alloy This was a landmark that was known to every Canadian on the Vimy front. To the west, you can see all the towns and villages and fields and woods that were all considered part of Canada in 1917. This area contained 100,000 Canadian troops, and it was virtually a, a province of Canada. It was bigger than any city in Canada, with the exception of Toronto and Montreal. And they had a whole community living here with uh, railway stations, with cinemas, with theater, with wristwatch repair shops, convalescence camps. They produced their own papers. You name it, like with any big town, they had all the same entertainments. They had uh, baseball games, they had football games, they had soccer tournaments, they had athletic events. You name it, everything was here. Dear Mabel, the Follies were greatly appreciated. Maud's dress was worn and looked very well. Also for the Romanian characters, the dress looked very well with a red sash. The officers who do themselves very well gave us the most excellent supper. 
and I enclose some badly taken photographs by the local photographer of some of the characters in our follies. Ever thine, Agar. The idea here was to coordinate the operations of the Canadian Corps and to bring it into a focus like a team. And it was that team that was going to take Vimy Ridge. By March 1917, even the most jaded veterans and raw recruits had become part of Julian Bing's team. But while the men fight in the cold and snow and sleet on the crater line, the countdown has begun. In the Chateau Comblain Labbé, General Bing and his staff feverishly finalized plans for the attack on Vimy Ridge, now only days away. We're on the grounds of the Chateau at Camp Land Labbé. This was Canadian Corps headquarters in 1917, and this is where Julian Bing and the staff planned the Vimy operation. At the Somme, the Canadians had been slaughtered by German machine guns and artillery left untouched by the Allied bombardment. Far more difficult than the Somme, the attack on Vimy Ridge will require a perfectly coordinated plan, guns and infantry working together. And to prepare such a plan, Julian Bing assembles a crack team, including the Canadian master of tactics, Arthur Curry. If the plan is not flawless, the attack on Vimy will end in a massacre. The big thing that Bing did was uh, the artillery preparation. It was uh, fantastic. So when the troops went over, most of the German positions were, were, were smashed. This had not been the case on the Somme, where the Canadians had suffered terrible casualties for almost no gains at all. And that's one of the primary lessons that he learned from the Somme. The second was that the men had to know where they were going what trenches to go after and how to do it. In a revolutionary move, maps are distributed down to platoon and section level. Each unit is trained to act independently. Accompanying a group to the chateau is Canon Frederick Scott. We had a large model of Vimy Ridge, which all the officers and men of the battalions visited in turn, in order to study the character of the land over which they had to charge. If German artillery remains in action, the attack will end in butchery. Observer balloons are sent up, pinpointing the guns. With air photographs and new maps, Canadian gunners rush to triangulate the position of each German gun, so that by the day of the assault, each Canadian gun will have its list of targets on Vimy Ridge. The Canadian attack will be part of a bigger offensive as 350,000 men of the British Army prepare to attack just south of Vimy. The preparations are immense. In front of Vimy for the Canadian attack, three miles of plank road are laid, 20 miles of tramway built, 42,500 tons of ammunition piled up, 1,000 artillery pieces pulled into the line, one big gun every 20 meters of front, one field gun every 10 meters of front and 30,000 Canadians in the line, concentrated for the attack on Vimy Ridge. Convinced that no one can take the ridge, the German commander keeps his reserve troops far back, 36 hours away. Julian Bing's orders are, take the ridge in nine hours. The attack is planned for Easter Monday, 1917, but two weeks earlier, Hundreds of Allied guns begin pouring high explosive shells onto the ridge. A week later, twice as many guns go into action. The week of suffering is what the German infantry call the last week before Easter. On Easter Sunday, Cannon Scott moves up to the front line. It was a time of mingled anxiety and exhilaration. What did the next 24 hours hold in store for us? Was it to be a true Easter for the world, a resurrection to a new and better life? If death awaited us, what nobler passage could there be to eternity than such a death in such a cause?
Dawn, April the 9th, 1917, Easter Monday. The four Canadian divisions are poised to attack Vimy Ridge. From the 4th Division at the northern steepest end of the ridge to the 1st Division at its southern end. Thousands of Canadian troops wait anxiously in the early light. 1,000 Canadian guns sit silent, waiting for zero hour. In the eerie silence, Canon Frederick Scott rises early. I climbed the hill and there on the top I waited for the attack to begin. It was a thrilling moment. Human lives were at stake. The honor of our country was at stake. The fate of civilization was at stake. I watched the luminous hands of my watch get nearer to the fateful moment, for the barrage was to open at 5.30. At 5.15, the sky was getting lighter. The fields, the roads, and the hedges were beginning to show the difference of color in the early light. 5.27. In three minutes, the reign of death was to begin. In the awful silence around, it seemed as if nature were holding her breath in expectation of the staggering moment. 5.28. 5.29. God help our men. 5.30. The tempest of death swept through the air. It was a wonderful sound. The flashes of guns in all directions made a dull red light behind the clouds of smoke, adding to the grandeur of the scene. I knelt on the ground and prayed to the god of battles to guard our noble men in that awful line of death and destruction and to give them victory. At precisely 5.30, the 8,000 men of the first wave of the Canadian attack begin the long, dangerous, muddy slog forward, sticking as close as possible to the creeping barrage, exploding just yards ahead of them. The Germans who have survived the bombardment send up flares signaling for help, but there is no help. The German batteries are silent, each Allied gun has found its targets. As the Canadian barrage creeps ahead, Arthur Curry's 1st Division attacks across the southern end of the ridge. With their front lines blown away, second line German machine gunners manage to open up a withering fire, cutting down up to five Canadians out of 10. Still, the 1st Division pushes quickly forward, the men tossing grenades into dugouts, killing many dazed Germans who don't even realize the attack has begun. As the second division fights its way towards the ruined town of Telu, Donald Fraser and his machine gun section head for the division's most distant objective to set up their gun against German counterattacks. At 9 a.m. we were ordered to get ready to move. Picking up our respective loads, we quickly climbed out of the trench and into the open. As whiz bangs rained down, we dropped into a shallow trench. Within a few hundred yards, I saw a 5th Brigade man struck in the head by a piece of shrapnel, which knocked his brains out. They were lying two feet away and resembled the rows of a fish. We're walking across the fields captured by the 2nd Division early in the morning on April 9, 1917. They moved so quickly into the village over here at Tilu that they actually captured a, a German mess full with the waiters and their white outfits and the whole thing. But the whole division moved across these fields very, very quickly, and it was a tremendously successful action. We got on the move again and made for a sunken trail to the north of Tilu. Looking around, I noted that Tilu was a village no longer, just a mere shell. Coming into the village, I ran into a German machine gunner face to face. He was a tall man with an overcoat on, and his sleeve he had a machine gun badge, mostly a silver thread, and very pretty. He was very pale and blood was trickling down one cheek. This cemetery was made right after the battle and then after the war they brought in a handful of graves. But it contains a large number of 2nd Division men that were killed in these fields. 
It's one of the most rarely visited cemeteries. It's quite pretty, but no one comes here. You can see uh, both sides of the line from here. You can see over here, Tilu Village, which was captured by the 31st Battalion from Alberta, Private Fraser's old unit. And this behind us, this be the north part of the ridge. And you can imagine the Canadian troops streaming right across here. This is 19th from Toronto. W. Thomas, killed in action, 9th of April, 1917, age 22. Forever with the Lord, which is far best. This one, Russell Tremere, just says asleep. He was 24. Just check the visitor's book. Starts in 1979 here. And it's probably about a third full. So probably 200 people in 20 years. This makes it an even more lonely place. Attacking the center of the ridge, the 3rd Division heads towards La Folie Wood. But from shell holes and shattered trenches, German snipers and machine gunners take a heavy toll, particularly on Agar Adamson's Princess Pats. My dear Mabel, we took all our objectives, pushing off at 5.30 a.m. in a rainstorm. Sladen killed, 10 officer casualties, including three killed. Pearson shot through lung and spine. I think we can hang on. Ever thine, Agar. We're in La Folly Forest, and this is where the 3rd Division, particularly the Canadian Mounted Rifles, came through on April the 9th, 1917. You can see all the shell holes, trenches, a lot overgrown. This is part of a concrete reinforcement of some form. Size of the bolt on the end. The Germans would have really made heavy defenses here. A lot of concrete that would be built right into the right into their trenches. This is a big shell hole from 1917. And it seems to be connected to an even larger one over here. This looks like a a basement of a building that's collapsed. There was probably a German dugout underneath and over the years it's subsided and the whole thing has collapsed into this big hole. This is a piece of a or a piece of a fuse off a off an 18 pounder shell. So that would could have helped with this big hole. Certainly wouldn't have made it. A hole of this side would be made by a naval gun if it was just one shell that made it. But you can imagine the artillery bombardment that, that destroyed the German positions before the attack. It was a very successful action. But there were a lot of casualties and at nightfall that's when the stretcher bearers would come in to take care of the wounded. There'd be hundreds of them scattered all over the battlefield. And one of those stretcher bearers was my grandfather. He was with the 8th Canadian Field Ambulance and his memories of Vimy were very vivid. And it was a sense of pride with him to have been here on this famous day. As the stretcher bearers carry off thousands of wounded, most of Vimy Ridge is already in Canadian hands. The 1st, 2nd and 3rd Canadian Divisions have taken their objectives. But the attack by the 4th Division has floundered in a welter of blood. And still holding the two highest and most fortified points on the ridge, Hill 145 and a plateau called the Pimple, the Germans can threaten the whole Canadian advance. A German officer looks down, 
on the dying of the 4th Division. In the entanglements of the German line, where the corpses lie in khaki heaps, the Canadian attack against us peters out in blood. Late afternoon, April the 9th, 1917. The Canadian Corps have seized most of Vimy Ridge. But the highest crest of the ridge, Hill 145, and the knoll called the Pimple, are still in German hands. Just before dusk, the Canadians finally drive the Germans from the crest of Hill 145. But the enemy fights back, desperately, hanging onto the hill's eastern slope. The next morning, the Canadians throw in fresh troops. Among them is a survivor of the Somme, 21-year-old Victor Wheeler. As soon as the softening up barrage had done its work and lifted forward, we were ready to stalk our own pacing barrage and advance over the hill. The first chap struck down was Sergeant Harry S. Diller. He was severely wounded by shrapnel. We sprang forward into action and an extended formation advanced towards the summit of the hill. Down went a dozen of Canada's finest chaps in the first 60 seconds. The distance between me and the next man as we lurched forward grew wider and wider every minute and left me with the sunken feeling of facing Heine and his guns alone. When the Buck Private is really thrown on his own, whether he will gain his objective and survive will be the best test of his courage. Perhaps for the first time in his life, he finds himself staring alone into the face of the Almighty. A breath of blackness blows on his innermost soul. We're on the highest end of Vimy Ridge, the only area that was uncaptured on the 9th and the 10th of April. It was an area known as the Pimple. All that remains here today of that fighting is this beautiful little cemetery called Gavinchion Goel Canadian Cemetery. And it's one of the nicest and most remote, historically anyway, cemeteries on the Western Front. You can hear the cars speeding by on their way to Paris. And no one has any time for these sacrifice here. It's a beautiful little cemetery. It was made in the rabbit warren of trenches that were, were all throughout this part of the Ridge. It was just totally uh, an impossible place. Shell holes, old trenches, barbed wire, and these men were all killed fighting their way along the trenches towards Vimy Ridge, Hill 145. You can see the nature of the graves. They're all packed together. There's often two or three names to a headstone. That's a trench burial. Officer of the 78th Battalion, which is Winnipeg Grenadiers, Major W.T. Hooper. 9th of April, 1917, age 38. Tell England that we died for her, and here we rest content. Unknown corporal of the C4 is buried in the same area. Private C.W. McClure, 72nd C4 Highlanders, Canadian Infantry, 9th of April, 1917, age 34 not forgotten. We had fought our way to the crest of the ridge, and now the Germans fought like animals at bay to drive us back up the eastern slope. I asked myself, will we have enough men left to take and hold our objective? At that very moment, Private John George Patterson, leaping ahead like a maddened Jaguar, bombed and then bayoneted all the men of a German machine gun crew that was hindering our progress, and came through without a scratch. His fearless act enormously encouraged us to continue toward our final objective. For his valor, King George V awarded Private Patterson the Empire's rarest and most coveted honor, the Victoria Cross. As we plunged forward, with the Dewey plane clearly in view, we now smelled victory. Corporal Victor Wheeler. On the evening of April 9th, the Canadians were in control of Hill 145, but the Germans were still clinging to the ridge. So the next day, 
On April 10th, the 50th Battalion with Victor Wheeler and other men from uh, British Columbia and Manitoba pushed the Germans right off the ridge. And this is the view that they had. This is the Douai Plain. You can see the city of Lens. You can see the slag heaps and this beautiful lush green territory. Now the Canadians were the ones that were in control. They had one more attack to make to secure the entire ridge and that was going to be at the Pimple. It would take place two days later. We went forward with chronometer accuracy, virtually touching the steel edge of the beautiful creeping barrage, always a few feet ahead of us. The whipping, cutting sound of hard steel fury was music to our ears, and the sight of the German dugouts, parapets, and machine gun emplacements exploding skyward was a pleasure. More like enraged Avengers than well-disciplined Canadian volunteer soldiers, we mills-bombed, shot dead, bayoneted, grappled, and rifle-butted the enemy. And within an hour, we had succeeded in capturing the pimple. Corporal Victor Wheeler. The pimple was a position that ran from that wood, which is called Givinci Wood, across that big mound. And it's from these points that about 2,000 men from Western Canada charged across no man's land in a blinding snowstorm and drove out the Germans from the pimple. They fought in the Bois de Givinci and into Givinci village and by the end of the night the Battle of Vimy Ridge was over. When they captured Vimy Ridge, the Canadians took thousands of German prisoners, many dazed, many only too happy to be alive. As he had hoped, in a few short months, Sir Julian Bing had transformed the four shattered Canadian divisions into an elite and aggressive Canadian Corps, and had led them to a great victory. Now it was no longer the German army that dominated the great wealth of the French coal fields of the Douai Plain. It was the Canadian Corps. We were now near the crest of the ridge. A perfect panorama unfolded before our eyes. The wide Douai Plain stretched to the horizon. The attack which we had looked forward to and prepared for for so long had been successful. The important strategic point which guarded the rich coal fields of northern France was in our possession. Dear Mabel, our observation over Vimy Ridge is magnificent. The Germans are falling back across the plain. News of the Canadian Corps' spectacular capture of Vimy Ridge resounds around the world, echoing in headlines from Paris to Tokyo. The victory at Vimy Ridge was so stunning and so complete that historians often claim that it was on Vimy Ridge that Canada as a nation truly came of age. But for the men who dodged the bullets and slogged through the mud of the shell-shattered patch of France, the cost of victory was not small. 21,000 Canadians fell, dead, wounded, and missing. On Easter Monday alone in a few hours, 3,000 young Canadians died. Here, on this land, where the scars can still be seen, on Vimy Ridge. Vimy is Canada's national memorial. It commemorates the sacrifice of the Canadians, over 600,000 who served in the war, and specifically those who died. The inscription here reads, to the valor of their countrymen in the great war and in memory of their 60,000 dead, this monument is raised by the people of Canada. The names on this monument are men who are missing in France and who died in the battles of the Somme, Festubert, Givinci, Hill 70, Vimy, and in the Hundred Days. Each name has a story. 
and it's that story which draws people into the history of this period. Every man here has one. The sight of our decimated ranks after the capture of Hill 145 almost tore the hearts out of us as we who were still standing looked around for our buddies and brothers and saw them not. Runner Bob Forrest spoke with tears in his eyes and said, I was the only one of 18 to come out alive. I knew we would not be back across the ridge again. So I stopped a minute and took my steel helmet off in remembrance. This statue is the soul of the monument. This is the spirit of Canada weeping for her fallen sons. And it's the centerpiece of the whole, the heart of the monument, really. It's a beautiful statue by Walter Allward of Toronto. This monument is just the most moving tribute to Canadian sacrifice. And as a Canadian, I'm instilled with pride when I come here. This is just the most magnificent uh, monument I've ever seen, to every detail. And the fact that it's, it's Canadian just, just moves me incredibly. <laughs> 